Good afternoon. It is um, Friday, five past one. This is a meeting of the Conservation Commission Subcommittee on Land Use. And we have present commissioners, Bruce Stedman and Michelle Lobb, and Amherst employees, Aaron Jacques and Dave Zomack. And today we have an agenda, which is on the web, where we're going to see if we've gotten any comments on our draft use uh, policy concerning dogs, which was provided to the commission the last time it met. Then we're gonna have a discussion about hunting on conservation land. And then we'll identify topics that might be ready for commission review. And uh, we'll look at our list of future topics. So, um, without any further ado, I'll ask Erin if she has yet received any comments on the dog policy. I have not. That makes light work of that subject. <laughs> <laughs> so we can check off that one. And um, I will mention to Dave that we did have a walk on the Wentworth farm property and I wrote up a summary of our visit. And in that are a number of suggestions, which um, has gone around to Bruce and Aaron and, and Michelle. It's not on the agenda to talk about, but we'd like to put it on agenda for, for a future subcommittee meeting. And there's a couple of suggestions which really have nothing to do with Wentworth, um, which have broader, broader appeal. Um, and I'll just mention one is uh, the formation of a trails committee. And without getting into a discussion about that, Aaron can brief you, but uh, I will, I'll, um, since it's been around to everybody, I'll send you a draft of our summary. So keep in mind that it's titled Wentworth Farm. And then at the bottom, there's some suggestions that came up as we kind of stood around and talked. So it's it's mistitled a little bit, and I haven't taken the time to separate out the suggestions. I think I saw that, Alex. You did send it to me, right? I'm, 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 I'll find it. I'm looking at all your recent emails. Yeah. I think, I think I saw it. Yeah. Well, just a heads up. We'll not talk about it today, but uh, would like to put it on the agenda maybe for next meeting to talk about an item or two. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. Still trying to hard to get, make sure we get everything done in this calendar year. So we'll pass by uh, item one with no comments on the dog policy from the commission yet and start our discussion about hunting on conservation land. So Aaron was kind enough to produce a map uh, buffering uh, roads, trails by 500 feet. And I think that's 500 feet on either side of the road and trail for a total of a thousand, but I'm not sure. And you know, she'll clarify that when we get there. And then I asked her to put on, uh, to identify the boundaries of the various um, conservation lands where the town website says hunting is allowed. She did that. And she told us that it's available on the website for us. And I sent you all a copy. So we'll wind up looking at that. And I would like to focus our discussion on firearm use on hunting. Um, we're gonna talk about the safety issues that might be involved. And I'd like to um, focus that, our discussion on, on that. I and mean, there's lots of other things we could talk about with regard to hunting, but focus on the safety issues. That's kind of where we're at. So Aaron, if you would do us a favor and bring up that map, um, unless somebody wants to have any comments and Aaron, please tell me if the public is on. Anybody got any comments to start off with? I would just be interested in having Aaron walk us through sort of the, what we're looking at with it. Um, just, I guess I wasn't completely clear uh, the color schematic in the um, um, yeah, I'd be in that too. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. I would appreciate that too. 
Yeah, it's it's really like a work in progress, so it's not meant to be like a, a final map, but I can definitely walk you through it. Um, and I don't see anybody on from the public. Okay. No, I spent quite a bit of time looking at the legend, which is why I asked her to put the red lines on for the boundaries of the of the um, uh, Amherst lands that, that allow hunting. So I can obviously clean this up and make it a little bit more presentation ready if we ever want to do that. But um, so the the yellow circles, which you can kind of see, they're the bottom layer. Those are the 500 feet from structures. So um, in this case, like houses, barns, garages. Um, in some cases, it might grab an occasional shed, uh, but it's it's basically the mapped structures that we have. So 500 feet from from sheds are from structures rather. And then the pink or uh, I guess cre uh, cream color there is the 500 feet from paved roads. So that's overlaid on top of the 500 feet from structures. And then the purple is 500 feet from trails. Um, and uh, yeah, so those, I, I kind of had to do multiple because there's multiple different layers for trails. Um, and then you can see underneath are the conservation areas. So I thought like where you can see the green poking through that that's where you have areas that are not being covered up by those buffers. So presumably not within 500 feet of a house road or trail. And then the red are identifying the, um, <laughs> and there's there just to clarify this there's conflicting pages on the town website um one page has a list of properties another page has a list of properties um so they're they're not exactly consistent but um this this incorporates in red the identified properties from both of the town web pages that say hunting is permitted on these sites hold on just a minute bruce so the in the very middle this long thing is the rail trail. Mm -hmm. It starts in the lower right, goes and makes yes. a loop, and then, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, exactly. that. Okay. Yeah. It's hard without roads and landmarks. It, it, it took me a long time to understand that TAN, which occupies so much of this uh, map, is actually a buffer. Uh -huh. Right. So thanks. Keep going, Aaron. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the whole purpose was for us to get sort of a visual of the properties that were um, outside of those 500 foot buffers. Um, and uh, be able to identify like which properties are outside of those buffers. And so that kind of the green gave us that depiction. But then Alex asked to put the the properties in red where where um, hunting is allowed. So this just gives you a sense of of that. Okay. So I also sent out um, Massachusetts rules that apply. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. I just I have two questions. Um, first, is is the 500 foot buffer on trails a legal thing or just a general safety guideline? Okay. So based on that, some hunting allowed areas are actually not ideal um, if we consider a 500 foot buffer. And then I'm, I'm just noting that. And the other thing I'm noting is that um, we have a couple hunting areas allowed where there's only a very small portion of sort of appropriately yeah. areas. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll get there. So I just had one other map related thing so in the upper third on the right there's a huge green area no no down further upper third no to the right now yeah there that uh, it's not a conservation area but it looks as though it reads as though hunting is allowed in that space it's not conservation land yeah where uh, the green yes. only yeah only the right so if you know if Presumably, if those private landowners hadn't didn't have their land posted, it might be. Okay, that's um, but I that's private to... private property there. Yeah, okay, we're just... only we're only talking today about land under the jurisdiction okay. of the Conservation Commission. Understood. So, um, and going back to Michelle, the five hundred foot 
is, I think, comes from uh, the Massachusetts law, which says that you can't fire a firearm within 500 feet. I think it's of an occupied residence or an occupied building. It also says you can't fire a firearm or, or an arrow across a paved road. And it also says uh, that you can't fire a firearm or an arrow with 150 feet of a road. So we took the 500 feet <clears throat> um, prohibition from an occupied dwelling. So a shed, a barn, they're not occupied. And this buffer uh, includes unoccupied structures. So the, it's hard, there's no way to sort them out. So the buffer, um, I'm not sure it makes much difference on the conservation land because we don't have very many unoccupied structures on conservation land. But that's where the 500 feet came from, I believe. Aaron can straighten me out if I'm wrong. Um, and again, it, it part of it was um, me not knowing necessarily all the ins and outs of what was allowed, um, other than the 500 foot from setback from a structure. So that's why that distance was used. Um, but I mean, I can adjust any of these buffers accordingly. Um, I think it's really just to give us a visual of where the con conservation areas fall. But again, we can adjust buffers if, if the commission would like in accordance with state law or however right. you see fit. So let's just look at Podic up in the upper left, for example. We've all been there. Dave took us there to talk about community gardens. There are trails in the woods and the buffers enclose all of those conservation lands according to the measurements that we've got. So there is a problem um, potentially of people discharging firearms or arrows in there within a certain distance of a trail. So I also sent out the hunting schedule, you know, the seasons, because hunters aren't in the woods all the time. I thought you might be interested. I think it's sort of irrelevant, but I sent it out anyway. Um, and I'd like to just from a safety standpoint, think about projectiles uh, in the terms of shotguns and black um, and muzzle loaders. And shotguns for deer hunting are slugs and um, large BBs. Um, I just use BB because everybody knows what a BB is, but they're, they're, shot um smaller shot size six and seven are used for birds but for deer it's slugs and call them bb's a slug carries um not nearly as far as a black powder rifle and a black powder rifle has no rifling in it so it doesn't go um as far as a regular rifle, but that's not allowed in Massachusetts. So um, the law does not prohibit somebody from firing a gun across a trail, only a paved road. So you can fire a gun across a path, across a gravel road, a woods road, so on. And as my thought is um, that as we build more and more trails, we have 80 miles of trails, I'm told. That's a lot of trails and, and people use them. Um, we've never had an accident and we don't want to have an accident. Uh, with regard to arrows, most people who are deer hunting are going to be in a tree and they're going to be aiming down. Uh, and their projection is 30 yards. Um, and to me, that's not as much of a concern as a projectile um, that's shot horizontally across the face of the earth and somebody not knowing what is in the background. And when I teach hunter safety, one of the cardinal rules is to know that you have a safe background 
when you bring that firearm to your shoulder. In the woods, you can't, you can't always know what's out in front of you. So we have a potential safety issue with um, shotgun slugs and black powder rifle projectiles, which is like a 50 caliber slug, and, um, and trail use. Nobody's been hurt, nobody's been shot, uh, and we certainly don't want that in the paper. So one of the reasons we're having this discussion is to talk about whether or not all the lots that are on the website should allow hunting in the future as we continue to build trails. So that's why I asked for this map. And um, just interested in your thoughts as we go forward. Well, I'm still confused about the map. So but bear with me here. If I look at the Podic one, it says that hunting is allowed inside the red, and yet the it feels unallowed because the overlap of the trail um, prohibition is complete within the Podic section. So yeah. given that, why wouldn't we just say it's not allowed there? Well, we may, but I, okay. I want to make a correction on what you said, because the the buffer doesn't mean it's not allowed. It um, it suggests that we uh, might have a safety issue. Okay, so the buffering is not a legal prohibition. No, it's purposes of this discussion only. So, but is the structure... One, uh, it's gone away now, but the structure buffer, is that a legal prohibition? If it's, a, if it's an occupied building, yes. Okay, but, and then... But we, the buffer doesn't differentiate between occupied and unoccupied. Okay. So there would be, there'd be even, like a barn and then that barn would get a buffer, which does happen in conservation areas. Yeah. Right. And then right. The so one, and I don't know I don't know if a power poles in a um in a power line. I don't know I'm talking about along the street, but you know, big power I don't know if they're I don't know what a structure is in terms of errands. Well, Buffers. like she said, it's the first draft. Um, the other thing I know, just for future reference, is under the paved road buffer, it says 500 feet. But then I think Alex mentioned it was 150 feet. So I, I'm a little confused about that. But So that's that's in the right. I sent you a write-up on Massachusetts rules. Yeah. And I may, be, I may get it backwards on what's the 500. I know it's... Uh, uh, well, 500 anyway, feet, 500, I think it's 500 feet for an occupied dwelling without permission or if you live there. Okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm totally hoping that this gets worked on some more and we stick with the policy end and I yield to Dave. Yep, yeah, Dave. Um, thanks. No, I think this is a great discussion. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, good discussion. Uh, I have no... I was going to say no horse in this race. I will say maybe no deer in this hunt. Um, I I don't have strong feelings one way or the other. Um, I guess, you know, Alex, you said a few things that kind of resonated with me. You know, I think this is all about safety and, and it's a good time, 2024, 25, to reevaluate where we are with regard to hunting. Um, I think, you know, it's important to kind of put it in context. Um Historically, we have not, as far as I know, uh, in the last 20 years, we've not had any hunting accidents. That's a good thing. Um, we want to keep those residents and those visitors safe on the trails. Um, I think it's important that uh, Aaron did point out that our website is out of date and inconsistent, but we kind of knew that. So again, a good reason to have this. Um, I also um, wanted to point out, Alex, you mentioned building more trails. I, I think the key for me would be to focus on the existing trails. Um, I am not, 
I am not that interested in building more trails at this point. We we we've got roughly 80 miles of trails, and it's it's a challenge just to keep them all open and passable. So, uh, and and I don't think we'll be purchasing much more conservation land uh, overall. I think most of our acquisition is probably close to done. So, I think I think it's great to be focusing on what we have. Um, and yeah, what's what's our goal? I mean, obviously, I think it's community safety and. And how do we pe- keep people safe when they're utilizing the conservation land? Um, and, and you know, I just put a question to myself, what do other communities do? I mean, there's a philosophical or a policy question. Do we allow hunting at all? I mean, that could be a, that could be a policy of the commission to say we don't allow hunting. Um, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying some organizations have gone that way. I'm, I don't know if any municipalities have. I'd have to. We'd have to search a little bit on that. But so those are my questions, kind of around 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 the topic and thoughts. Yeah, I think Amherst can be. Hold on, Bruce, just for a second. I just want to echo sure. Dave. Amherst can be proud that it is number two in the state of Massachusetts for the amount of conservation land that it has. Mm, absolutely. Probably, Dave probably knows who's number one. Maybe it's Lincoln. I don't know. Yeah, it might be Lincoln, Concord, Sudbury. I'm not yeah. sure. One of those may be in that. Yeah. yeah. We used to be the leader in APR land, but Hadley passed us some years ago. Well, we can still be proud that we're number two in the in the Commonwealth for conservation land. And a lot of Abs- that absolutely Dave, Dave Zomack's credit and his predecessor. So um and with regard to what some towns have done, I grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, and I used to go duck shooting on the Sudbury River with my father. And um, my relatives created what's now the beginning of uh, Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge right on the Concord River. And um, I can't, I couldn't go duck shooting on the river now. It's, you can't, it's, the town won't allow it. So, <laughs> um um, I don't know if they allow pheasant hunting and that kind of stuff. I didn't do that homework, but things are changing and people's views have changed. So this is a good time to bring up this topic. And I, I think this map from a safety standpoint gives us a picture to talk about regardless of its foibles. Um, nobody's saying it's exact and, but still it, it's a visual that, uh, none of us could describe in words and understand and and communicate very clearly. So I really appreciate Aaron creating the map. And uh, I don't know if it needs to be cleaned up much for purposes of our discussion or even the commission, because we're just talking about those conservation lands where the website says hunting is now allowed. And um, I think there's nine of them. I might be wrong in that number, but I have a list. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yep, nine. Well, and and um, Dave, I'll be right with you, Bruce. For those that are in Pelham, Bob and Peggy Gage and Houston. Shootsbury. Uh, Shootsbury, Houston Gage, yeah, in Shootsbury. In Shootsbury. Yes. So I wrote down Pelham. I don't know where I got Pelham from. That is a very strange outlier. <laughs> very strange, but yeah, long history to that parcel. But yes, by some fluke of nature and law and whatever policy, yes, we own, we we own and control that Houston Gage parcel in Shutesbury through a. Uh, a self-help grant. Very strange, but we do. Yes. Glad we do. Bruce. And did you have a question about it, Alex? Or, or it was just to I say know. we have that one parcel? Yeah. Well, I I was curious. It's an outlier. And now I'm glad to, to point out that I got the town wrong. I'll fix that. The, when I looked at the maps, it it the maps are not very well labeled. For example, uh, on the maps that I distributed, there is not the name of the uh, parcel very clearly provided. And um, 
you have to kind of know your way around to know where you are in Amherst. Bruce. So uh, I have two points, I think. One is I would I would be in favor of giving Shrewsbury their land back, but that may not be possible. Secondly, um, I think this is in many ways like the dog discussion in the sense that if you come at it from the 80 miles of trails and all the people who use the trails, then there is this question of the interaction between the people with dogs and the people who don't have dogs. There's the interaction with the hunters, with the people who have dogs and the people who don't have dogs. So there's this interactive part of across the trail network that is a big part of our responsibility to kind of make that interactiveness work. And a piece of that goes to the educative side of doing a much better job of having a cleaned up website and having maps that are clear and getting educational information out and et cetera. So that feels to me an, an end point of the, both this subcommittee and the commission as a whole as to how to, once we've figured out how do these things go together, we have to teach people about how they go together. So this is, it gets, Michelle, go ahead. You can finish Alex, I'll follow up. It gets, uh, it gets complicated, which is one of the reasons I sent out the schedule for hunting seasons because somebody could go turkey hunting on those on those lands with a shotgun using number um anywhere so i think it's number four to number number four number five number six shot which doesn't carry very far and probably not cause any safety hazard um certainly archery doesn't provide the safety hazard that that uh, that a muzzle loader does and somebody could go uh, pheasant hunting, quail hunting. Um, uh, I don't know if we have partridge, partridge, woodcock, so on and so woodcock. forth with dogs on our land where it says hunting is open and probably not create a safety hazard. So not all hunting creates the same safety hazard. Um, and um, I don't think a strong safety argument could be made for bird hunting, for example. Uh, so um, that's why I wanted to focus on uh, firearms and, and the projectiles. Uh, I but... guess uh, maybe I was trying to make a, a slightly sideways argument or, or comment that if somebody is walking on a trail and they hear a gun go off, they don't know any of the caliber. They don't know which season it is. They don't know anything. And therefore, it's our, you project out to those concerns. We had a guy come to our meeting and express his concern about four months ago. So yeah. that's the talent I see here. Michelle? Yeah, I mean, just real quick to Bruce's comment, I've been on trails and it's been like open field with patches of wood and I was with my kids and heard gunshot and I couldn't see a anybody and i didn't know what was happening so it was scary and we left um just because we didn't know the circumstances of it um but anyway that's just anecdotal um my impression of, of looking at well there's another thing is that if if we do want to consider alternatives so that we're not just saying no hunting in amherst what we're not seeing in the picture is like private lands that do allow hunting of which there are some significant acreages and at least I know in, in North Amherst. So this isn't sort of a blanket outlaw and hunting um, availability in Amherst. And I know that's not our purview today, but um, there is alternative lands currently um, for people to go. And then I think wherever we go with this, I just want to evaluate the sites that have only portions of suitable suitability and probably knock those off the list because I think if we decide that hunting is allowed on certain properties that it should be pretty clear um, what the properties are and their boundaries so it's just to keep it simple and not you know only half of this property from A to B is allowable because I just think that it has to be one, the property is open or it's not open, but if it's it only partially suitable, I think it's just kind of unfair to assume that everybody is going to 
know that on the ground. So I see three, at least three sites that meet that, three or four. I don't know how big they are really, but three, three or four or five sites that would still be suitable for hunting under this analysis. Yeah, uh, Aaron, could you go to the bottom of the map and maybe blow that up for us, Bruce? I was just going to add that, like the agriculture section, the context does matter. And that's what uh, Michelle was saying about, well, there's a lot of other places, some other places that on private land hunting is, we can't ignore that in the context of trying to figure out what we do on the ones we control. The same applies to the agriculture. And also state land, just wanted to note that. Right. I sent, I sent out a summary of what's on the Amherst website. Um, hunting is only permitted in the following town of Amherst conservation areas. All other town of Amherst conservation areas are closed to hunting. So the town is talking about only the land it owns. It's not talking about private land. That's in support of what Michelle was saying. There is not a prohibition in the town of Amherst against hunting and the town of Amherst only exercises its authority on the land that it owns. Dave? Yeah, I like where this is going. I, I wanted to, if we could keep going with, with Michelle's train of thought to kind of maybe say, well, there are these areas where we just don't think it is safe to hunt. I was going to say, um, yes, you know, these need to be simple, clear, consistent to Bruce's point. There needs to be a rationale. Why are we, why are we not allowing it in these areas and perhaps allowing it in this conservation area or part of this conservation area? Um, and, you know, I, I start to think about enforceability and more about um, communicating. How do we communicate this? If we say Atkins Flats, hypothetically, is open to hunting, how do we how do we message that out both along trails there, um, along boundaries and on our website and anywhere else? Social media, you know, we could use social media as, as uh, uh, different seasons come along to remind the public, hey, we only allow hunting here. I do think it's really good. I think as Bruce and um, Michelle talked about the context, there are a lot of other places to hunt in Amherst, not as many as there were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because of subdivisions and, and people posting their land and whatnot. But there are still private pieces of land owned by Coles. And, and Aaron also pointed out, uh, you can hunt all of the land in the Mount Holyoke Range State Park. Um, I would also point out that we allow hunting on our watershed lands, some of which our water supply protection lands are in Amherst, Belchertown, Shootsbury, Pelham. So, yeah, so um, those are my thoughts. Um, and we could allow, to uh, Alex's point a few minutes ago, we could allow certain types of hunting and not others. We could say bird hunting is allowed at Atkins Flats, but not hunting with X. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not an expert on firearms, Alex, as you are, but, you know, you, you pointed out the how far these projectiles uh, uh, can go, and and that is a that's a that's an important consideration. But we could say bird hunting is fine, but deer hunting is not, or w whatever you know, or or a particular kind of firearm. So I think it's all good. Michelle, I've never seen that bird hunting, but no deer hunting. But I was thinking the same thing based on Alex's explanation. Um, it seems to be like kind of trying to be reasonable and uh, has good rationale. Has anyone, I just worry, is it too confusing? <laughs> is it, you know, making, is it splitting hairs too much um, to do that? Or have you guys seen municipalities or private lands that have allowed one, but not the other type of hunting? I'm willing to take up um, a task of consulting three or four other towns. Maybe Dave can help me. Um, um, and I may look to the eastern part of the state. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I grew up in Concord. My family comes from Lincoln. My folks used to live in Lincoln. I know those people. So and I could talk to other towns too, but I could, I'm not going to call 20 towns. 
I could so I could call a smattering and maybe Dave because of his knowledge of who's who's active in the conservation land activity in the state could help me out. Yeah, Aaron. I was just going to say, Dave, I know DCR holds a handful of um, CRs. I, I is for those. Oh, did you have something to say? No, oh, go ahead. Somebody is um, just waiting for me just to answer a oh, quick question. Go ahead. Uh, um, I was just going to ask if there, because it's a state held CR, if there's an obligation that we allow hunting on those properties. I think um, one of them's down by the bike path and one of them's beside Sweet Alice. I don't so think so. My quick answer is I don't think so, Aaron, but we probably should look at those. I've never, I've never, I don't know, ascribed to the fact that if the state owns a CR, it comes with the implicit requirement that you allow hunting. But I know the state folks sometimes have a different opinion on that, but we should look at that. It's a good question. Yeah, I know in Sturbridge there, there was a property held, the CR was held by Mass Fish and Wildlife and it being open to hunting was a yes. requirement. Um, I think so that's so. a stronger case yeah. because it's yeah, held yeah. by Mass Wildlife than say right. DCR. Right. Um, I agree with Michelle and Dave. Whatever solution we come up with should be like a toggle switch. Um, very easy to enforce. Um, either the light's on or it's off. And not even consider splitting a conservation parcel where we're putting signage up at the edge of a buffer. That would be a nightmare to do. It would be a nightmare to administer. And um, um, so I, I support finding some um, easy to administer solution, even if it means allowing hunting with certain implements or types of hunting and not others. For example, uh, deer hunting with archery, we might consider allowing that versus deer hunting with shotgun or firearms. Firearms and shotguns creating the safety hazard more than archery. There may be other people who say, no, I don't want to split that hair. Uh, that's too hard to uh, administer or whatever their reason is. So we're not done with this conversation, I don't think. And um, I would, with your permission, like to continue it to our next meeting, but not three or four meetings. I would like to come to some some point where we can go to the commission with something, um, even if it, it, just to get some feedback from them. Um, so we can keep rolling along on, and uh, I'm mindful of our deadline at the end of December and that's not that far away. We now have 15 minutes. We have some other items on the agenda. Um, I'm happy to talk about this some more, um, um, but I would like to take at least five minutes at the end for the other agenda items, particularly what what's ready to go to the commission. Anyways, Dave, yeah. Yeah, I like, again, I like where you're, where you're taking this, uh, Alex. Um, I think, again, simple, enforceable, let's not split the hairs. It, it just is going to create more challenges for field staff, for us to answer questions, rationale why, you know, if you walk I don't know, from the Podic, let's say hypothetically, I don't know, I don't, maybe I shouldn't take Podic, uh, Atkins Flats again, you know, the first part is not open to hunting, but when you reach this point, it is, it, it gets, you know, it, it gets challenging. So, uh, you know, and, and, and again, I think it's interesting to think about those ideas, but I think we have to think about the practical nature of them and the enforcement of them and the outreach and education back to the point that uh, Bruce made earlier is, how do we educate the public about, about this? Um, and I do think Michelle made an interesting comment about being out there with her children. And I think we've all had this experience is you might be out on a trail, hear a gunshot, and there's no solution to this. You It may have been on private land adjacent to. Um, 
I took my family up on the Mount Holyoke Range for Thanksgiving a couple of years ago, five or seven years ago with some young children and said, oh, no problem, no problem. You know, there's a trail right here. Shouldn't be a problem. You know, da -da -da. we were not 10 feet from the car and somebody um, uh, uh, discharged a firearm. Literally, it was so close. We all jumped to the ground. That's how close it was. But again, it was a trail, so I don't think there was any prohibition on hunting near that trail. It was, you know, probably my bad to take somebody out and, you know, during what was November, was that deer season, uh, Alex? That would have been probably deer season around Thanksgiving? Yep. Yeah. So anyway, so we've all had that experience. So well, and we did have the gentleman who came to the uh, the meeting. The other thing we, we need to think about is hunters can walk across conservation land to get to private land yep. with their firearm. Yep. And so that can sometimes raise, ah, are you hunting right here? I'm on a conservation land. So that's part of the education process. And that, that, that provision right there is on our website. What's on... that, Bruce? I didn't hear Bruce. Oh, I was saying there was something we read that said they could walk on a trail to get to the place where they were hunting. That, that's on the town website. So, I, so the other interesting law I discovered about hunting is that you're not supposed to be able to cross railroad tracks with a firearm. So if you're accessing a property from a trail and you have to cross over the railroad tracks, you're not, then that property essentially shouldn't be, I mean, that's what the state law says. I, Just I, interesting. I look at that. It may say that the firearm has to be unloaded which is what's required to cross a road. Yeah, I think it's a, it might actually even be a federal law, but I'll, yeah, it, it was uh, a question that was asked from that gentleman who had come to the CONCOM meeting and there was conversation going on about uh, its Luckily, legality. we don't have any railroad tracks on our conservation land. Well, uh, like, we, North actually right. had one crossing it. We didn't go that way on our walk, but there's a railroad. Yeah, I mean, it, over by Brickyard, isn't there one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're losing our fifteen minutes. We're down to ten now. Can I just say one more thing about hunting? I'm sorry. Um, one is I I want to just throw out there, uh, being mindful about uh controlling deer populations. I don't know how big of a deal this is for Alex is shaking his head. I mean, people are putting up deer exclusions in some places because of the problems with herbivory. Um, two, Alex, can you comment on the range of like a compound bow? I think, you know, whenever people say bow and arrow, if people are thinking romantically about like pullbacks, but <laughs> compound bows can be used too. And, and they have much greater range. Um, is that comparable yeah, the, to uh, bird shot? The Massachusetts actually has rules on how many pounds of pull needs to be on a uh, on a bow, and it's forty. Uh, I believe it's forty pounds. That's that's a pretty good pull, and a forty pound pull can go. I don't even know what the range is, but probably a hundred yards. Um, uh, but what I what I most bow hunters are in a tree, and so their angle of their shot is down towards the ground and it might in their deer stands they they measure off distances um out to their range from that stand so if a deer comes along they can see approximately oh yeah okay that's 40 yards or 30 yards or 25 yards whatever so that they can adjust their sight but they're not shooting a hundred yards. They're not shooting 70 yards um, in most cases. There are bow hunters that don't go to a tree. I don't, I don't, I don't sit in trees. I don't like the height. Um, that just made me think that, well, it's good that they're not completely connected, but uh, we wouldn't want people building tree stands on conservation lands anyway. Um, so there are, there are tree stands which are um, you carry them on your on your back. Okay, portable ones. Yeah. And and people can carry them in on the day that they're going to hunt. That's 
usually not what somebody does. They go in and they'll put a temporary stand in a tree oh. and um, do that during daylight hours and then come back to it during the hunting season and then take it down when they're done. So, um, yeah, there will be stands and trees um, for bow hunters. Your scent, your scent is off the ground in a tree with most prevailing winds. So you can have deer walk right underneath you. They don't know you're there. Hello. Huh. Deer get pretty smart. And they do look up into trees. But yeah, tree stands as a whole. I'll just say, if you want a toggle switch kind of a situation, assume there's going to be tree stands. In in what for if don't, if somebody's going to hunt on conservation land with a bow, the odds are better than ninety percent that he's going to have a tree stand. Okay, that's interesting because I'm not sure it's consistent with you know our use policy right now. So just something to consider. Okay, so um, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and with your permission, I'd like to continue this next time. And in, in the interim, uh, please give it some more thought on splitting hairs and what you're comfortable with. But also, what's the best way to, to, to present this to the commission, assuming that we can come up with a recommendation so that we don't have to go through the explanation and the discussion that we did? Uh, I'm happy to write up something. At this point, I don't know what to write, um, but I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a concise way to communicate to the commission so that you, Michelle, as chair, could um, chair the chair that discussion when it comes when we hand them the item to consider. So far, we haven't spent any time talking about the issue, and. Um, um, it would be great if we could continue that pattern, but at some point there's going to be a discussion by the commission on this issue. I just can't see them. I Not think that the map and just saying pay attention to the red outlines and then where the green shows through, we can just say it like that, and then everything else is some kind of buffer associated with it. And I, that I don't think we need to make it prettier with you know a simple explanation. But before we adjourn, I did ask Aaron to put. Um, some time on our agenda for Wednesday to um, discuss land use uh, subcommittee update. So if we want to bring the dog one to everybody, I mean, I know we haven't, I don't know what our due date was, but it might have already passed. So if this is ripe for the discussion, um, I think we gave people three weeks or something, or we asked for three weeks, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm just saying that we have a very light agenda. And if we want to try and tie something off, it would be good to do it on Wednesday. Here, here, here. I was just going to say, so, you know, we've, we've given them the draft of the dog policy. There hasn't been any comments back. So I'm just not sure what really, like if we want to open up a discussion with the whole board about the policy, or if we're just saying, this is your chance to comment. Um, but my thought would be, we've, we've done a significant amount of work on some other sections. Like I think forestry was done or close to done like if we could get that to the commission yep. and say here's a comment period for that one and then any other sections we could kind of keep them going in chronology you know in in some sort of like systematic way so that at each meeting we're presenting something for comment um and then then we could collate it all and do one hearing public hearing where we discuss the overall document at the end um would be kind of the way i would suggest going about it because we will have to have a hearing at the end i believe to codify it bruce i think there's a reasonable chance that even though we're giving them time to comment on each section and they they mostly don't which is understandable when you get to the hearing and we know that everybody then will have to vote at that point, we will get more comments because they will read it with more the realization, oh, I have to actually vote on this now. Okay, so I, I'm with Aaron. I'm ready to um, uh, look back at the forestry thing 
and um, uh, get that ready to submit to the commission. Do we have, what's the deadline for putting something in the folder uh, or putting it on the agenda, Aaron? I've already got it on the agenda, which I'm about to post. Um, I just put it there kind of as a placeholder, figuring we'd figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. But I think as long as like, maybe like early next week, we get it up there. I think it's it's a very light meeting this this week um, or this coming week. Very light. Okay. So how about if we do this, hand them the forestry for their comment, give them a deadline and bring up dogs and say, we haven't gotten any comments, but we'd like to have a brief discussion um, and put a time limit on it. Can we also add the dog section to the folder so people have it fresh in their face and it's right. kind of impossible to go back in time to get anything. So maybe they'll do two at once and that would be great. But so forest, would we say forestry and dogs in the folder? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so the next time we meet, we'll, um, so that takes care of, of, you know, what are we ready to present? That's an, a, an agenda item and um, two minutes um, and then dogs and I allocate some time to hear about dogs. And then when is our next meeting? At the next meeting. Well, oh, this of this group. Oh, no, the next meeting of this group, which um, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but it's two weeks from today. Two weeks What's from that? two weeks from last Tuesday. So that's the seventeenth. Uh, I'll assume that you're correct. So any, any objection on the seventeenth, and it's noon to one, right? We're going back to the yes, yeah. Alex, can I just say you said think about a rationale for the hunting discussion, and you know, I, I think I think we've covered a lot here today, and I think you know, I think if you could be thinking about the rationale first and foremost is user safety. We are charged with making sure people are safe out on these public lands. And I think we start with that. There are more and more people using, we learned during COVID uh, and that, that bubble has continued to, to show that there are more and more people seeking outdoor experiences, families, children, runners, hikers, bikers. So I think, I think we lead with that. And we're, we, we have new information, we have new mapping um, and, and that's what spurred this review of very old those those uh, areas, all that information on the website is very old and really goes back to, you know, Pete Westover and previous commissions. So I, I think we lead with that. I think it's a very strong rationale to say, you know, we are we are looking at areas that we think are safe, and here's the rationale why we why we think that is true, because of their size, because of the few trails, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that I don't want to go over that we went over today. But I think that's where we start. It's a common sense approach to safety on conservation land. Thanks. Okay. Good. Any closing comments? Aaron, do we have anybody on the public with us? No, we do not. Okay. Then I can give back a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Today was great. Have, have a nice weekend, all. Everyone. Bye, bye everyone. Bye-bye.